welcome to this week's edition of The Magnet. You know that The Magnet is a program that features veterans, those with a Midas touch. In fact, today we have an exceptional guest in the studio. She's somebody who has occupied a seat that has only had a female in that position. Not talking too much about our guest for the day, let us give you this profile. You will agree with me that the resume is as intimidating as the personality. We will be back shortly. Fola Shade Tolu Lokwe Ogushola was born on the 14th of November 1958. She's a Nigerian professor of medical microbiology. She specializes in disease control, particularly HIV AIDS. Professor Fola Shade is also the immediate past provost of College of Medicine, University of Lagos, and she is reputed as being the first woman to occupy the position. She doubles as the Deputy Vice Chancellor, Development Services. Of the institution since 2017. As a child, Professor Falashade mimicked medical practitioners by using dolls as patients while offering medical care to them. Between 1974 to 1982, Professor Falashade obtained a first degree from University of Ife. She got a master's degree from College of Medicine, University of Lagos, then proceeded for a doctorate at University of Wales between 1992 to 1997. Professor Fala Shade Ogunshola was the provost of College of Medicine, University of Lagos. Her research areas has been centered on the regulation and management of viral diseases. She is the principal investigator at AIDS Prevention Initiative in Nigeria, APIM, at University of Lagos. She has also been the chairman of Infection Control Committee of Lagos University Teaching Hospital. Professor Fala Shade is also the chairman of the National Association of College of Medicine in Nigeria. She is a site principal investigator of the Medical Education Partnership Initiative in Nigeria, MIPIN. Professor Fala Shade is a member of the Technical Working Group on Infection of the World Health Organization Afro Regional Rapid Response Group of Experts. She has received a number of awards and recognitions including the Federation of European Microbiological Societies Overseas Research Scholarship in 1993, Medical Women's Association of Nigeria, the Kisto Symposia Global Health Travel Awards in 2010, Medical Women's Association of Nigeria, the Extinction in Medicine Award 2013, and the Distinguished Alumni Lecturer at the 7th Professor T. Adesoya Ige. Grillo Memorial Lecture of Obafemi Awolowo University, Ileife, in May 2014. You're welcome back. The program is still the magnets. And my pleasure to welcome to the program Professor Mrs. Folashade Tululokwe Ukunshola, the DVC, that is Deputy Vice Chancellor. Development Services, University of Lagos. You are welcome to the program, ma. Thank you very much. Thank you for very much me. for finally having us. <laughs> <laughs> We've been at this, and thank you for allowing us to have share a little bit from your very very tight schedule. Thank you. Okay, now we we'll run through your CV and your profile. Just before we start looking at you on the present day, tell us how was your growing up like? I mean, that you finally decided to say, okay. Medica, it is for me. Well, um, I think, well, I grew up in a university campus. Okay. Uh, my father was a lecturer. And, but I think, I'm an, and I'm the firstborn. So I've always sort of wanted to take care of with people. And I remember I used to play with dolls and I was a doctor. So I think it just, it's something I've always wanted to be. Okay. And um, it didn't change. And so I went to primary school, secondary school, and I, I went to university okay. and did medicine. Right. And in talking about doing medicine, you majored into microbiology. Yes. I, one would think that uh, you either do anatomy, obstetrics, gynae. What was the interest for microbiology? Well, uh, microbiology is not, you know, microbiology is wide. Okay. So it's clinical microbiology, which is really about infectious diseases and understanding microorganisms and how they impact health. So our job as clinical microbiologists is when we see a patient to be able to work from the organism 
to determine what are the likely things that can happen because this organism exists and what are the things that we need to do to identify it and what are the best antibiotics that you can use or even if you, if you don't need it at all. And um, so you essentially work from the lab to the patient, um, not the other way around. And you tend to be, if I may say, oftentimes the consultant's consultant because then you work with various groups and when they have problems in the area of infection and they come to you, okay. what can you do for them? Now getting into microbiology was a bit interesting because it was not my favorite subject. Okay. I actually started off in pediatrics okay. um, and um, I had done quite a number of years there before I was, should I say I was um, enticed oh, yes, oh, into clinical okay. microbiology. <laughs> um, I had a brother-in-law who was a clinical okay. microbiologist and it coincided at that time with the coming of HIV okay. and somehow I, many things came together and I found myself doing a, a course that if you had asked me when I was younger was not on my agenda at all. In fact, my life has been a lot of things not on my agenda and I find myself <laughs> surprises. <there. laughs> surprises. Mind that touch. Talking about microbiology and you talked about you know HIV. Now, you are still one even though you are more of an administrator now <laughs> based on you know, the position you now occupy. We have a lot of infectious diseases. As far back that I knew you, I mean, your office in Luth then was a big hive of activity, trying to diagnose one of these and the other. Now, let's look at infectious diseases. A lot of things I imagine. What's your take? I mean, it's, it's becoming quite uh, dangerous or in an alarming stage. Um, I think a number of things are coming together. Um, it was once said um, that um, the future of infections will be in all sorts of viruses, and we're seeing that. Part of that really is because of the exploding population of the human race. We're going into ecosystems that we did not before. We're displacing the animals and coming in contact with organisms that we were not in contact with. Um, and we're taking up their space, so there's a lot of... They are voting. Well, we're, we're, it's like, we're, it's a new understanding, it's like marriage. You suddenly come in contact with people you didn't, you have to learn to live with it. So some will kill or some will not. Some will probably be infected with all, other organisms that we did not know mm -hmm. because they didn't cause too much problem or we could deal with them. Um, but we will be seeing a lot more of this. I mean, organisms that are circulating in in animals, and Ebola is one of them, mm -hmm. for example, Lassa fever is one of them. The more human beings come in contact with these, that will happen. The other part of it is the, a lot of people where you have poverty, you have war, you have uh, mal malnutrition, they're more susceptible. Poverty in particular, then people are living in overcrowded places. We have a lot of urban I mean, rural yeah, urban drift. We have huge slums. Yeah. Where the, you have slums, you've got rats. You've got all sorts of other rodents and mm. vectors that carry diseases that we did not know before. We have climate change. There are things that are changing. Um, insects that were devoured by colder climates. Now those climates are warmer. They're flying to more places to the than... Atmosphere. Exactly. So, and we don't... Those are the ones we know. But this is also, there is also might appear to be an, a, a, a larger than normal growth of epidemics. Mm -hmm. But that's also, there's also a part of it that as human beings become more proficient at diagnosing and finding them, it might actually appear bigger mm -hmm. than it is. Whereas before, people will have a problem in one corner, nobody knows about it. But now we, our surveillance of infections are higher. So we actually quickly pick up things that are happening. Whereas maybe some years ago or decades ago, we may have Just missed them. We, yeah, and then the world is so small now that infections in Africa will get to America. Infections in America will come to Africa because they have a place. Everything is a, a flight away. So the, the, the way we can move the transportation systems have made infections that much, much more easy to spread okay. so uh, okay talking about spread you know as much as let's look at the, 
the economic or the business aspect of it now. A lot of interventions have happened. We talk about the foreign NGOs. We talk about even government intervention. How successful has this been, even from your practice and from curtailing some of these diseases? Let me say, I think it is getting better. Um, I think the initial interventions, even from abroad, as well meant as they were, one of the things that I felt um, we did, that was not well done was that we did not invest in the systems. Okay. We created silos. Um, if you think of the vast amount of money that came in through the HIV grant, um, it's led to lots of NGOs. The question really is, how much of that went into the main hospitals, the universities, to the ensure that if you use those people who are naturally in the area of health care or who are in the social services and work within our institutions, we would have strengthened those institutions. And when the money went, people who have been enabled will continue to train because that's what they do. Um, but I think what has happened since then in many ways is that we've learned. And so what I have seen that makes my heart sing is that government is now beginning to use its own institutions so okay. that if money flows in, if it flows, for example, into Luth and you use it to improve services there during that epidemic, when the epidemic is over, that institution has been improved. It's not going to go back. The doctors, the nurses, other healthcare workers there have had the impact of new information, new knowledge, new technology. It's not going to go back. So we will continuously rise. Unlike before the NGOs wake up, there, there are some that continue, but many are NGOs just for that project. And after the project, that's the end. That's the end. Okay. So you will, if we use all this help to strengthen our institutions, then we would be better. It may be a little more difficult, okay. but I think it is what the way to go. Otherwise, it will be wasted effort on the long run. But the Ebola epidemic mm. was a turning point. Yeah. And I think government has started to use its institutions. And since that time, there have been evaluations of how we respond to epidemics. We now have more people who can do surveillance. We've had field epidemiologists developed over 400, and I know there are more. We've had um, labs that have been upgraded. We can diagnose the flu, this present coronavirus. Mm -hmm. okay. We can. Um, we have the labs that have the capacity to do so, and we have the people who can. Um, we've, we've improved in many ways some of our infection prevention and control. We're still lagging behind in infection prevention and control, but a lot of things have started to happen. So if we continue on this trajectory, one, we will diagnose infections more, so it will look as though we have more, uh, and we may have more, but we are beginning to understand it and th there's been a lot of growth at the, you know spread in terms of early diagnosis so there's still work to be done but i think that's we're key early diagnosis because i remember again let me say as a foremost microbiologist can you look what is the importance of the nigerian center for disease control because uh, oh. as much as we hear that a lot of new diseases are emerging are they prepared are they really oh, on the ground they've done amazingly well. Really? If you go to their website, you will see okay. the resources, the daily updates on epidemics, even the last of fever. You go there. They are following it up. Okay. They have people on the field. They are coming up with guidelines on how to uh, address these things. There's, they've worked to enable and to um, ensure I think we have about, I can't remember for sure, I think it's about 14 labs around the country that have been properly enabled that can take care, can diagnose Lassa fever, all these uh, uh, yellow fever, cholera, and so on, and they, they continue to work. They've been so successful that there are quite a lot of um, international organizations that work, want to work with them. Success breeds many of friends. Course, of course. Nigeria is a huge country. Um, health is on the concurrent list, but they've managed to be able to work with different states so that they, they've created a good network and they keep working to do that. Um, 
in terms of infection prevention and control, mm. they're also championing it. Okay. So it's, I, I think we have to give them kudos. Uh, kudos. Um, where we were coming from was bad. The NCDC, I think mm. they've done a great job. And I think we have to um, give kudos to them. Nigeria is huge. A lot, a lot of work done mm. does not always show mm. immediately because mm. of the, I always call yeah, it the no dilution <laughs> factor. <laughs> so that sometimes we keep thinking nothing is being done, mm. but a lot is being done, but a lot more needs to be done before it shows because mm. it's going into a very huge country mm. with lots of people. Talking about the dilution, some people believe that the various interventions today are not really felt. You know, you have the foreign NGO, you have the government intervention, you have internally generated revenue and all that. Because it's a business program, we must look at that. Is it? A, well, um, do you believe I, that? I agree. I think we could be more efficient with our health. Um, for health to be felt, we certainly cannot be, be funding out of pocket. I'm a staunch believer in the national health insurance. I think people need to go and register. It is not a perfect system, but if you don't start a system and run it, you cannot fix it because there will always be teething problems. Okay. So when sometimes as Nigerians, we want something to start and be perfect. It does not happen anywhere. I think we always have these expectations. That's one. Two. For any system to work, the people must work with the government. If we as a people are not ready to invest in Nigeria and be ready to, you know, give feedback, instead of grumbling, we grumble, but we do not give feedback. For example, I'll tell you, people will find something is wrong. Then you'll see something circulating in social network. Be forwarding it to everybody till it gets to government. And I'm thinking, why are you going in a roundabout way? Why don't you just write to the, in, if you're serious? Do you get what I'm saying? If you're truly serious, mm. right? Then they'll say, no, nobody will listen to me. I said, still try it. Mm -hmm. you, it you cannot complain that something will not happen when you have not worked right. the system. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Thank you yes. very much. We're still chatting with Professor <laughs> <laughs> Fola Shade Ubinshola, DBC <laughs> Development Services, Unilag. We'll go for a short break. When we come back, we'll look at another aspect of her. Let's give you this uh, short report from her. Archive. Every single one of you has a special gift, a talent, a skill, something that you do so well that no one else does as well as you do. And it's important for you to know what that skill is that thing is, that gift is. Every creator of God has a disability. To my understanding, we have people that are short. We have people that are fat. We have those that are slim. We have light complexions and we have dark complexion. We have people that can see from afar. We have people that cannot see beyond their nose. Every creature of God has a disability. And according to the team of this program, ability in disability. All these children need our support. Both emotional support, financial, physical, and educational support. These are our teachers. They are equally challenged teachers. I have Mrs. Sanaudita. We also have Mr. Okay. 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 That is our instructor, as far as the disability, is able to take the children through. Then we have our beats here, also from the arts room. We have our beats, uh, necklace, we have a rock here, we have our bag. Then this disinfectant that we can see here, it was made by the special children. I am pleased to know that a school is encouraging children to be creative, to collaborate, and to showcase the skills that they have. Yes, they are special ed students, but it is obvious that they've got gifts, they've got talents, they've got the ability. And through their collaboration, they've created wonderful works 
that people are purchasing and people are able to appreciate. Everybody has an ability. I, I, it, your physical limitation does not stop you from achieving whatever it is that you desire in life. Um, and all of us are born with some form of disability. It's just for some people it's much more obvious. Um, but it does not limit you. It may limit the things that you do, but it does not limit your ability to fulfill the purpose of your life. Uh, there is always ability in disability because every human being is created with one disability or the other. But the government of the states has thought, has thought it's wise to make sure that we have inclusive section in some schools. So like this, it's all our state junior government school. It's, it's an inclusive school. And with the exhibition I've been able to see today, the exhibition of their talent and the craft they have been able to do, it shows they really have innate talent in them that needs to be brought out. All of them has vision. They want to be successful in life. And that is why the school has been trying its best to bring out this talent in them. There is really ability in disability. Because, you know, God that created all these as special children, you know, they have hidden talents in them. And, you know, we are out to bring out all the hidden talents. And that is where we are showcasing them. You know, things they can do with their hands. Tailoring, catering, hairdressing, farming, poultry, and all sorts. Welcome back. The program is still the magnets, and we are chatting and sharing thoughts with Professor Falashadi Ugushala. Thank you very much for still having us. You're uh, welcome. Coming on the magnets. Now let's look at another aspect of you. Before now, you were I mean, you're still a practitioner in microbiologist, but before your present office, you occupied the provost office in the College of Medicine, right? Yes. Um, some people will say, what is the difference between a provost and a CMD? Meanwhile, they are in the same enclave, so to say. You want to tell us? I mean, I am glad that you have been the only female that has occupied that position. <laughs> How did you feel when you probably got that appointment? <laughs> Challenged. <laughs> um, being the first female, mm -hmm. I felt in many ways that I needed to prove myself. Uh, because there were people who had been skeptical about a woman being able to do that. I was, I was never in doubt that women could do it. And after I finished doing it, I was even more convinced mm. that women in the provost position would be a, a breeze. Women bring a perspective to positions Jobs. that are a little different. Mm -hmm. I think in terms of emotional intelligence, we're a little bit better at it. I mean, not every woman mm -hmm. is, but... If, you know, in terms of averages okay. and in any position if you cannot work with the people around you and, and motivate them to do their best then you're not going to go far you alone cannot do it and I think one of my strengths is was able to share what my vision was and have people who were ready to work with me on it and to have people who believed in what I was doing outside and were ready to invest in the college. So I think what I brought to the table, and then I also believe in empowering people. I'm not a micromanager. So people will make mistakes. I, that's part of the equation. But it, mistakes are learning. I believe mistakes are learning. They're, they're learning. When you've made a mistake, you know that's one way not to go again. That's, you've cro crossed that path.